Welcome to Pigeon River Farm, doing farming right. I'm Robert Brown, the owner of Pigeon River Farm. Thank you for viewing. Well, good evening. Tonight I'm going to have on our lecture series, I have Bill West. Uh, he's the premier fish guy, I'd say all around, and in, in probably in the United States. Uh, he de developed a lot of technology here in raising mm -hmm. farm fish in a very unique process. And Bill's going to go ahead and explain how he does it. So Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bob. <coughs> uh, good evening. My name is Bill West. I, um, I run Blue Iris Fish Farm, which is just west of Green Bay, Wisconsin and Black Creek. And um, I've been doing it for about 15, 20 years. It's not a big operation. It's about a 40 acre farm, but I have a number of ponds. And my objective is to do research for for people if they have little capital at all. So my objective is to help the, the small guy, if you will. Um, you, you can take my techniques and, and uh, go as small as you want or as large as you want based on uh, the amount of water that you have. But in the back of my mind, there's an awful lot of people out there with backyard ponds that don't do anything with them other than throw fish and maybe once in a while the grandkids come over and catch a big fish. But in my mind, um, you can use that for fish production and uh, do a whole lot more for, uh, for your table. So with that, let's get started. Um, what I want to do is um, kind of teach you about using a small pond uh, and I'm going to go through some of the things that I've done over the last years. Um, basically, if you want to do it, I, and I'm a perch farmer, by the way, that's probably, I should uh, couch that with the whole thing. But you can do some of these techniques with other fish. Uh, I've been successful raising bluegill, some bait fish. Uh, maybe some walleyes would fit into this, and there's other fish too. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, if you're going to do a, a a perch uh, operation, um, you have a choice. Uh, the full system considerations include you have to have water that would house brood stock and, and they would be there for conducting on-site spawning. Uh, they would be hatching. Uh, you would probably want to be doing some feed training uh, for the first year. And then you have to be able to overwinter them and then you have second year grow out. Now all of that can be done in one pond, but it probably would stress the system a little bit after, and I'll, I'll show you, point out some of the, the issues there. <clears throat> so what is absolutely necessary for your operation? Well, uh, you can carry everything out in a single pond, um, but it's hard to raise both broodstock and fry in the same pond, mostly because perch are cannibalistic. So. If you don't have a forage fish, a, a minnow, let's say, uh, yes, Bob. Uh, what what is a fry? A fry is is just a, a juvenile fish. When they hatch, they would be called fry up to a certain stage, and then they get to be a, a fingerling, and then so on and so forth. But the fry is the, you know, like uh, I would say the first month to two months, they could be called fry. And uh, it, it's the size, basically. So, um, so basically, it's hard to raise both the big fish and the little fish in the same pond since they're cannibalistic. If you had a bait fish, uh, and I would recommend, uh, let's say, a fathead minnow as a bait fish because they're pretty much mind their own business. They don't—they're uh, not cannibalistic on perch. Uh, but uh, the perch are certainly cannibalistic on them. Um, the other thing is if you have a single pond, that means you have to have water in it all the time. If you have more than one pond, you can drain some of the, uh, one of the ponds over winter and eliminate some of the problems that you have with carryover. And some of those might be uh, parasites like um, yellow grub and black spot, um, and and uh, certainly pond weeds, if they can get a start, they're going to be a problem if you can't drain the pond and clean it out and start fresh every year. So 
and since we know that perch will take anywhere between two and three years um, to get to full size if you do nothing but let them uh, feed and find their own food in the same pond, then you can't drain that pond uh, and therefore you, you are stuck with one pond, you're stuck with multiple size fish and again they're going to be cannibalistic on themselves so you're going to take a lot longer to grow. So I'm going to talk about how we circumvent that um, in, the, in the upcoming slides here. So, <clears throat> so we'll, let's, let's take you through a typical year and I'm going to tell you what happens the first year. What do, can you expect? Well, you have brood stock, so let's say that means you've got fish that are already three to four years old or older, and those are basically your brood stock, and they're in the pond all the time. They're going to start spawning in central Wisconsin somewhere around the end of March, uh, the first week of April. Now, I've been monitoring this religiously since uh, 08, and I've had some two years probably uh, the 15th of March and one year way in the middle of April. But by and large, right around April 1st is when I start seeing, and it has two things that have to occur. One is water temperature has to get to a certain uh, level, and, um, and it, you have to have an amount of daylight. So when those two things coincide, you're going to get your, your spawning. Now, when that happens, uh, perch lay eggs in ribbons that you can actually handle by hand, and you have to collect the eggs and transfer them into a hatching pond or a tank. And I'll show you some of this in a, in a little bit, but that begs the question, where do you have your second pond? So before I said you could do everything in a single pond, you can leave them sit there and they will hatch just fine, but if you want to protect those eggs, you want to get them out of that pond and put them someplace where you can see what's going on and make sure that they hatch. After they hatch, they have to inflate their swim bladder in order to maintain buoyancy. So a lot of times uh, we're doing this in the tank. We have to make sure that we give them enough uh, time and uh, the, the conditions to, to inflate their swim bladder. Otherwise, that'll cause them grief for the rest of their life. And um, then we want to do feed training. Now, I've, had, I've been asked many times, don't they already know how to eat? And I said, well, yes, they do. If you don't ever feed train them, and that means getting them from uh, their normal diet onto some synthetic diet which is fortified for their needs. Uh, if you get them onto a synthetic diet, they'll grow three to, uh, two to three times faster than a, a normal domestic diet. So that's what we call feed training. So we train them to go onto a synthetic diet. And you can uh, you'll continue feed training them for one to two months, depending upon when you bring them in for that purpose. A lot of times I start about three, four, five days after hatch, uh, but a lot of people wait until they're a, a bigger size. And I'll go over that and show you what happens. Um, but you continue feeding. Once they're feed trained, you continue feeding them on fortified diets for the whole first summer. Now, in if you're not an indoor facility, what happens? Well, all of a sudden the water temperatures start going down, the daylight goes down, they feed less, and you gotta prepare them for winter. So I stop feeding maybe the end of September. Uh, surely when the water gets cold, they're not eating much, but there's where the, the backup plan, which would be fatted minnows comes in. They can forage for themselves, and I let them be themselves and go on their own and feed naturally all winter long. I don't feed them. And the, the water temperature is going to be, you know, just a, just above 30 degrees, above freezing, and you know. So they're, they're, they're very slow, the metabolism. So I don't feed them. Other people, some people do, and some people actually feed brood stock so that the brood stock themselves are healthier. I haven't done that yet. So, so that's what happens the first year. It looks pretty simple. Um, okay, so now here, 
Uh, I, what I said is you take the eggs out of the pond and you put them somewhere. Well, there's a number of different ways of doing it. This is nothing more than a cow tank, and they build these racks that suspend and they're kind of beveled. And then you can see these white things. Those are all ribbons, and each of these ribbons, uh, these are smaller ribbons. I would say they're maybe two feet long. On my perch, I have some very mature perch. When I say mature, they're uh, anywhere between 12, 15, 16 inches long. Those, uh, the older they get, the larger the ribbon. I've had them as long as six feet long and over 100,000 eggs per ribbon. A lot of people ask me, how do I know there are that many? I says, because I count them under a microscope and then I kind of, no. Uh, small ribbons have smaller eggs and there's a, no, a lot more per gram, but the bigger the egg, the more viable they should be. Um, so we, we have a choice on what eggs we choose if we're going to be doing this. So if you have a whole bunch of eggs, um, a ribbon could contain 20,000 eggs if they're young. They could, like I said, of the older, they could contain 100,000 eggs. So you have to decide which egg ribbons you're going to choose. Um, when you look in the pond, you're going to see, geez, are those fertilized or not? Um, any, any eggs, and uh, you can see on this one, this is a different style. Um, this is nothing more than a 55-gallon drum with a basket suspended on the top, and it's aerated. And you can see along the top there's a ribbon. Uh, there's several, one ribbon pop that's this white area. Now when you look into that, you're going to see good fertilized eggs look yellow. And therefore when you um, look at a ribbon of eggs and say, geez, there's a white one there, white, 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 and some of those, the whole big white mass, those eggs aren't fertilized and they will uh, be a problem because they will turn, they'll get a fungus on them right away and, and that'll get uh, over the whole mess of eggs. So you want to avoid any parts of ribbons that are, are bad or the ribbon altogether. You can, if you have enough ribbons, you can choose. So that's two. Um, these eggs will probably hatch. Now, you'll also see um, this has got air aeration here. And on this one, uh, there's an aeration right in the center, which overflows the column and bathes the, bathes the eggs in, in, wa in aerated water. And that's essential because the eggs themselves, as they get older and get ready to hatch, there's a lot of uh, strength, uh, a lot of ammonia that's given off. And so you have to aerate that away from, um, from the eggs themselves. Otherwise, they will uh, turn bad on you. And then here's another. This is one I've actually tried. Again, I, you, have the, oops, uh, you have the cow tank here, but in this one, I put a rack all the way in here, or a net, and I suspend it in there, and all the ribbons are laying on the, on the rack. Now, this is kind of unique. Um, this has an a, a opening on the bottom, which I have a pipe. Now, the pipe, you can see on this one, and that's a bottom drain. So the water comes here into the, that's always flushing the eggs, and the, the pipe basically becomes the overflow, and that overflow comes over into this thing. Now what is this? Well that's a dorm hamper. Um, I, I've gone through a lot of stores and some of the, uh, these things are small enough mesh so that they will hold the size of the fry and the rotifers that they eat. I never thought that could happen, but it does. So this is one of my best friends is a dorm hamper, which you can pick up anywhere. and. Um, uh, so then, what happens is the, the little rotor furs, uh, or uh, the fry, get concentrated in here from this tank here. It underflows, goes into here, and by the thousands, 10,000, 20,000, depending upon how many eggs and ribbons you have in here, are in this dorm hamper. 
and then the water goes through and overflows and away that goes and here you can see the bottom again bottom draw that goes out and runs off back to the pond and then I take these now the one thing that you got to be worried about is you never take the fish out of the water so when this is uh, I put a pan underneath this dorm hamper lift it up out of the water and all of these uh, fry are in there and then I transfer it over to a bigger tank which is a thousand gallons and and then I release all these fry and I start over and collect some more so this is a <laughs> it takes about um, a week now it could take a long time it, I've had them go like this for 30 days which is not good because and it's all the spring weather this system right here if it's outdoors it's exposed to the elements and that'll really make the, the whole hatching system take a long time and that's not good so you can do this indoors I do have a hoop house now where what you want to do is keep the temperature close to um, you can ramp it up but don't ramp it up too fast because the development of the egg goes too fast but you can, uh, your, your eggs are supposed to be laid at 50 degrees uh, in the spring. And b between 50 and 55 degrees is a perfect egg development window. And then you can ramp it up one degree centigrade per day uh, to get the temperature where you want it. And then when you're close to hatching, the eggs are going to, uh, you're going to see eye up. I have a question, Bill. Yeah. Um, you know, are you talking in Fahrenheit, the 50 degrees, or centigrade? 50 degrees centigrade is uh, pretty hot. So you're talking 50 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm assuming. Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit, yes. and then bringing it up. Yes. Yeah, I, I, and yeah. I mix the two. Not a problem. I do that all the time. But uh, you're going to be, your window is going to be from 50 to 55 degrees while they're developing. And right at the end of development, you can you can play games now I'm going to go back one slide because here you have all the eggs and, and you can uh, you can watch these eggs and, and it's easy, easier to watch in this one because they're right there and what I've done most recently is I've left these eggs in the pond and let all of the uh, watch them develop and when I see eggs starting to eye up I know I'm within two days of hatch so what I can do, or when I put them in this one here, I can, sit, I can sit and watch them get close to hatching. And when they're close to hatching, I can take this out and transfer it to the big uh, uh, tank that I'm going to transfer them to eventually. So you can play games with this, but once they're getting eyed up, then the water quality goes down because there's so much ammonia being added to the water because of all this when the eggs start bursting all of this stuff is going in there so you want to keep that you got to clean it all out um, so that's what that's this is all about and in here this doesn't happen because I'm transferring fry as soon as they they come out they go to the bottom kind of and they get siphoned out and in there and then I can move them into the big big tank without any of the debris so that that's that now here's here's another way I've done it uh, in this one you can't see it very well but there's a great big mesh here that's suspended underwater and you can see a couple ribbons in here this one I just did that and again I don't have to do anything other than add water now you see this one right here normally I, I run a tube down the side wall and that provides my incoming water when when you're planning on getting the fish to inflate their swim bladder they have to come up and gulp air to do that and this arm here is now horizontal so that I'm spraying the water on the surface to break the surface tension so they can do that so there's little tricks that you're going to learn, and this is a, you know fodder for another seminar, if you will. But I mean, I you 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 don't see the tricks that I'm I'm pointing out as we go. And again, on this one, 
I put the basket on the over the top of the outfall and and so I'm doing exactly the reverse of what I did on the previous slide here I'm putting the basket on the outfall so that I'm preventing fish from getting out of the tank and I can keep that on for two three weeks until the fish get big enough where I can use uh, pipes that have holes drilled in them that fit the size of the fish and this is all it's a game they're playing with the fish or I use a hardware cloth of different meshes to cover the, the, the orifice on the pipes so and you just keep increasing the mesh and, and the, the smaller the mesh the more cleaning there is that's the only problem with that so and that I think is all okay that's all I have on on hatch tanks I mean there's I just showed you three or four different types of things and these are all easy to do uh, in your backyard making all this stuff and you know there's no secret to it so now let's talk about limitations on egg and fry management well um, the tanking eggs to remove what it does is it removes the natural predation so uh, if you've got all the eggs then you just leave them in the pond well that's the first source of protein you're talking April 1 how much new food is out there for all the other animals in the pond if you have any other fish I mean they're grazing all the ducks and the geese that are flying in because they're migrating out well geez everything wants to eat I've got when they spawn I've got fish jumping out of the water and the eggs are hanging on the grass and you know in along the shore well I got raccoons and everybody coming along and so uh, the reason you take eggs out of that situation is to protect them otherwise you're losing a lot of your crop right off the bat by just ignoring the needs of the eggs so in order to get eggs so that you can work with them you you, you had to have to have them so you you tank eggs in order to um, to protect them like I said they're the first protein source of the year um, they need to inflate uh, inflate the the swim bladder so if you're in a tank you've got to figure out how you're going to protect them to do that a lot of times shallow water works better than deep water uh, again I showed you that aerating arm that breaks the surface tension that's very common uh, again uh, in the in any time you tank the fish there's a tremendous amount of oxygen demand so you have to keep aerating the one thing I learned in a hoop house is um, and I haven't solved this problem yet but if you aerate in a hoop house the air in a hoop house might get it into 80 degrees in the springtime right when you don't want it more than 55 if you aerate warm air what does it do it takes all the air in that tank that you had and it might warm it up to 60 degrees 65 degrees during the day so I have got to the point where they only need air uh, they don't need much air because the water cold water holds air but the if you keep pumping air in from the hoop house if you had the air draw from the outside it's gonna cool it down and if you do it from the inside it's gonna heat it up and you can use that to your advantage but you've got to be you got to know what you're doing so but I've, I've, I've played with that this past year and it's worked fantastic so that's something to consider but the bottom line is you have to aerate to get rid of the um, the waste from the fish now after you and that's why sometimes it's more important to separate the fish from the eggshells and all that stuff that is inside the egg the, I don't know what they call it. it it would call it amniotic fluid and all of that stuff but in a fish um, they have all that fluid in there and that's a big draw on oxygen so if you can separate the fish from that and transfer them into a separate tank now you don't have that oxygen demand that you had so this is um, I don't want it to be complicated but um, I want to point that out so if you wonder why fish are dying well 
it, it, there's a lot of reasons. But oxygen is probably the number one thing you have to, con I don't care what size of fish is, uh, if you're doing, other than pond culture, uh, you're always worried about what you're doing in the, uh, the ponds with, or tanks with respect to oxygen demand. So you got to be careful. Sometimes, um, if you're if you're transferring fish from the pond uh, to to tanks for feed training, uh, some a lot of people do that, and it's probably it, it could be more successful. But you cannot handle the fish uh, until they're at least three quarters of an inch uh, to one inch in size. So you can't seine a pond that has fry in it. Uh, without doing damage, and it'll kill a lot of fish if you transfer them when they're too small, simply because you've crushed their their body. And uh, there's a lot of weight that we don't take into account. So if you transfer them in water, that's in fact when I mean, they're that small, that's all you can do. Um, I'm going to show you a slide later on about the right size, what they look like when you seine a pond for the purpose of bringing them in to start feed training. Now, uh, typically, um, your first feeds for perch, and I, I do start when maybe about five days. I like to start after they're supposedly have their swim bladder inflated, but I've been successful at about five days. But your, your fish food has to be absolutely small. Even your live feeds have to be small. Usually we're talking under 50 microns. And um, so then when you, uh, you start your synthetic food for fry, you're talking about food that's going to be somewhere between 60 and 80 percent protein, which is extremely high. And then as they get older, you can go down on the protein into the 40s. So that's very important to have a very high protein diet for the, for the first feeds because their normal feed is very high in protein. And anybody that raises animals knows uh, you, you have to pay attention to that. There's all kinds of formulas for, for uh, first feeds. Yes, Bob? Yeah, I want to share something uh, here on the farm. The great fish we got from you in our pond, we have situation, we have cull eggs. So we have extra eggs from often in the spring of the year because uh, they produce so many and them eggs that we need to uh, disperse them one way or another. So I ended up putting them in the pond. And in the pond, uh, I could just tell the fish go crazy over that. And mm -hmm. it's pretty, uh, pretty exciting to, to see that. So it's, it's one of my feed sources. So I just oh. wanted, to, wanted to share that. And again, with you. very high protein. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thanks. Yeah. OK, so then we talk about fry management. Again, before I said uh, you can't handle fry uh, until they're three quarter to one inch out of water um, and then after that so this slide here uh, this is a guy uh, that, that did a seining and you can see his hands are there and uh, when you seen fish you're, you're talking about uh, I remember one time we took out uh, 10,000 fry in a seine one one net so this is about what they're gonna look like they're only maybe an inch, and you can see they're little butter balls, you know, and then you, you transfer, put them in a bucket and transfer them um, to, your, uh, to a tank where you're going to feed train them. And that's the purpose of, of doing this. All right, first year production. Now, I, when I say first year, again, um, the year, depending upon your, your latitude, uh, let's say we're in Green Bay, uh, my first year is going to end by September, and, uh, and, and another key thing about perch is uh, they start putting eggs on in August. So the mature fish are already putting on eggs in August. So if you were out fishing and you caught some fish and you said, oh my gosh, this, this has got eggs in already, you would think they didn't spawn yet this year. Well, they did spawn, but they start putting them on already in August. So you catch fish in August, September, October, my goodness, they're going to be full of eggs. So 
a lot of the body mass of the brood stock are going to be going into feeding the egg mass. So what we've got is a, all your first year fish. Now if you took a bell curve and, and, and said, oh, what, what size should my fish be? If you were feed training your fish, all of the fish should be uh, three inches or better. Now some of them, uh, the, the real shooters, we call them, uh, are, are going to be six to eight inches even. And we're talking four months old. Now those fish, uh, you can do a lot of things with those fish, but what I would do is call them out and put them in my brood stock as brood stock replacements because the thing about perch that you probably have to know is that the female of the of the species grow two to three times faster than the males. So we can use that to grade our fish and to call out by sex almost. So at the end of September, when we're looking at the bell-shaped curve, if there is such a thing, and there probably isn't, but when you're feeding all the fish, the ones that are way off to the right are your big, large females. And, and instead of wasting them or putting them or eating them, if you will, those are really good fish. Those are premium brood stock. So if you wanted to, and every year you're going to have to replace some brood stock. Something happens, maybe an otter got in there or something. Uh, but you, you're going to replace some brood stock. So use those good ones. And those actually probably ate a whole lot of the little ones over the year, including all your... your uh, synthetic feeds but they they go after and eat a lot of their cannibals like I said but then there's a next batch and I would say you're gonna get between 20 and 40 percent which are all females and they're gonna be range in size from four inches up to six inches those are what I would call premium grow out fish now what I mean by that is those are all females, and you can take them and put them into a situation, and here's where a second pond comes in really handy. You can put them in a second pond, and just those fish that are going to be tanked for the next year for grow-out. So I'm a grow-out facility, and I want to, because I always, I always think that people should eat fish. If you're, I mean, that that's what we're all about. If we're a farmer, most of the stuff that we grow is for consumption. So what I'm thinking is, all right, I want to be a grow-out facility. I want to grow the fish. So I got to be able to, you know, when I, so I'm going to overwinter them in a second pond if I have it. Or you can put them in the first pond, but then you better have a forage base for the brood fish because they're going to, eventually uh, when you go through this all summer you get to a point where the fours and the fives and the sixes don't eat each other after a certain point they quit eating each other and they just they're all feed trained so all they're going to do is eat the stuff you give them well that allows them to grow exponentially compared to just eating other fish really so you've got that segment now the other segment is some of them are going to be um, females, but most of all of them are going to be males. So that's a disposable group unless you want to find in that batch some premium males. Uh, and I do know a way to identify when they're small, the difference between male and female. That's a different thing I'll go over because I don't have pictures of it. But... Um, Somehow you want to keep premium males for brood stock too. And, uh, but most of the time I would say they're expendable. So you could use those as stockers or you can actually throw them in with the brood stock because they're going to eat them anyway. All right, so you, you're going to lose a lot of that. But so you have to know what you have and identify uh, females versus males and sort them out. And this is an easy way to do it. And it all could be done by, by August, September. You, you know exactly what you have based on how fast they're growing and so forth. 
Now, all of these uh, fish should already be on a, a larger diet. And as I said before, um, the protein for the fry are going to be up around 60 to 80 percent. And the protein for these guys is going to be around 40. I've seen good food at 45 and a fat content of about 10 to 12 percent. And, um, and by this time, uh, we've gone from feeding uh, percent body weight on a fry is up around six, and we've gone all the way down to about two percent for this this larger size fish. So those are all numbers I'm just throwing out. I don't know if you've, you're paying attention to this. You can write this down, but this will be available, and I'm assuming. So that's where we're at on the, the first year production. So at the end of September, this is what you should see. Now. Uh, a lot of people get hung up on calculating feed rates. And um, I, I wanted to, what I do at the beginning of the year is um, <clears throat> I'll take those overwintered fish. And um, I want to start with four inch fish. If they're bigger than that, so much better. But I know I'm going to feed 2% body weight and I'm going to feed them a certain size pellet. And I'm, I'm, and I'm migrating. I'm only going to be using two size pellets, a two millimeter and a three millimeter for this fish. But in order to calculate what you have, I'm going to put in um, so many fish. And so you take your your fish, and 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 those fish are going to weigh so many pounds. Now, some people uh, like to use pounds. But the pounds that you're going to be using are so small, they got a point zero zero zero, you know. So some people go to grams. Either way, doesn't matter. You got to know how many pounds of fish you have in your tank when you start. And um, you're, I'm talking, I'm talking about a tank, and I don't want to talk about a tank if we haven't really got into that. I've got another seminar I'm planning. To do on tanks, but uh, this is one way to use a single pond with a tank next to it and uh, really capitalize on production. And it's cheap. All right, so we take our total pounds and um, we multiply that times O2, and that'll give you 2% body weight. So you multiply your total pounds, and then uh, here's a number that's about as controversial as you can get. Uh, you multiply the total pounds that you got before and you multiply that again times 0.9 which is the conversion rate. Now you see 0.9, holy man, can fish actually convert it? Yes, they can. Um, but when I started out on this, I was told 0.5 is the number to use. And um, I used 0.5 for many, many years and found out that it was absolutely wrong. So I started back calculating my results, and I ended up with, first, first I started with 0.75, and, and I still wasn't getting the results, so I ended up with 0.9, and that's not too bad. So what that means is 90% of the food that you're throwing in the water is converted to fish, which is, I, I, I'd, I'd like to see another animal do that, right? Okay, so that's why fish are so good at, at raising fish. As long as we can keep the food prices down, we're okay. So, in order to do this calculation, we have to do the total pounds of fish. We multiply it times the two two percent body weight, which is times 0.02, and then we get a number, and we multiply that number times 0.9 to give you the mass that the fish gained each day. So when you're doing day two, you've got to take the same number that you had up here, but you have to add the mass that you gained the day, and now you have a new number to for the second day. And, and the nice thing is, this is an easy Excel spreadsheet. And you can actually put this on a Excel spreadsheet, and you can drop it down, and you can find out the day you started and exactly the day you want to take those fish out of the water based on the weight you want at the end. And if you carry this spreadsheet out, that'll tell you exactly how much you fed them, 
how much it's going to cost, you know all of that. So this is a really, you know, this is a nice spread. You've got to have a spreadsheet to do this. And you can, you can change the factors by changing, whoops, I didn't want to do that yet. I want to, the two numbers that, you might see, and there it is. The two numbers that change everything is how much you feed per day, this 2% body weight. I've ex I played with 2.5 and I played with 1.5, 1.75. And what you want to do is if you're doing more than that, you want to watch the bottom of the tank to see what accumulates on the bottom. And if you're doing less than that, you want to go a week or two and check the weights of the fish and see if they're gaining to match the chart that you've, you've made. So, all right. So that's, that's how all that works. All right, so, so let's do a feed example. If I'm gonna throw in a thousand gallons of water, I'm gonna throw in 1,500 four to five inch fish. So I've got that in a thousand gallon tank, and this is perfectly, now I'm, I'm taking these 1,500 fish, and I'm assuming uh, a weight at the end, not a weight at the beginning, but the weight at the end. And why am I doing that? Because those same 1,500 have to fit in the tank when they're 8 inches. So I'm calculating how much mass they're going to be at the end of the time they're growing and see if that's enough tank for them. So that's why I only start with 1,500. I could start with 3,000, but I would have to have, I'd have to split them several times during the summer in order to make them fit the tank. Anyway, 1,500 is a good number for 4 inch fish to go to 8. And by, by uh, doing the calculation, um, they weigh about uh, 21, 22 pounds. So if you divide that out, you've got 70 pounds of fish that you're starting with at 4 and a half. And if you multiply that out by 2% uh, body weight, you've got 1.4 pounds of food. Well, that's a little bit, you know, a good-sized cottage cheese box, <laughs> you know. So that's all you're feeding, 1,500 fish in a day. All right, and I feed them on a belt feeder. The belt feeder runs for 12 hours. So if you put it on the belt feeder and you run it for 12 hours, it's feeding itself all day long. So fish are eating all day. And um, there's a couple other tricks too, but the, anyway. Um, so where am I? I've got this 1.5 I multiply. So I got the mass that they're gonna grow on the first day of feed is 1.26 pounds. So then, on day two, I now have 71.26 pounds of fish that I have to feed, and your Excel spreadsheet shows that. So the next day, I'm going to do that. Now, at the end, the end point is going to be 125 to 130 grams. Well, 3 to 3.5 fish to the pound, and since 454 grams equals one pound, then 3.5 times 130 grams equals 455, which is pretty close to one pound, no matter how you look at it. So, and that's where I want to end with my, uh, for market. So, in, at the end of the year, uh, there's going to be fish that are nine inches. There's going to be some, and nine inches is perfectly fine. After nine, you have to know that perch start getting what we call secondary bones. And so perch that are bigger than nine inches have to be flayed twice if you don't want people eating bones. So it, there's no reason other than people that absolutely have to have jumbo perch on their plate, then they have to do a little bit more uh, filleting. Or, you know, or you have to deep fry them a little longer to you know, get them all uh, so that they go right through the digestive system without a problem, right? So, all right. Okay, year two. Uh, oh, we, we, we got one year done. So year two, we've got, uh, you get, when you go into the second year, very few of the last year's fish are going to spawn. There's, there's a couple of those bigger females that are going to be ready. The males aren't going to be ready at all. Um, 
when you go into the pond, um, the water will go out, or the ice will go out, I should say, about April. So what I'm looking at is you got to start throwing food off the end of the dock, let's see, so that fish can get, they all start coming back. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And uh, so I'm going to feed them for about a month before I get them all out of there and put them in the tanks for the, the grow out. So they'll, they'll start eating the 1st of April. They're hungry. They're really hungry. And there's, there's something called compensatory feeding that goes on. When you starve fish, you can take them off food for a, a week. It doesn't affect them. And when you put them back on food, they overcompensate for the loss, and they have compensatory feeding, which means they'll get more, they'll feed more and gain more weight initially and then they get back to their old ways but there is a compensatory feeding that goes on and this is when you really can make up uh, lost time with with the feeds and and when I do this uh, you can move fish um, when you move fish in summer it's a stressful time when you move fish when it's cold out very little stress because there's so much oxygen in the water the fish are cold they don't mind well, maybe they do, but we don't, we don't know that for a fact. But I very seldom lose a single fish when I'm handling fish in May from April to the first two weeks of June. Very seldom lose a fish unless you accidentally step on one, you know, or something. But by and large, this is the time to move fish. Okay, now. Now, uh, this... Yeah, there's a, when I talk about tanks, um, it's, it's a matter of, again, I want to go back to the costs. So um, I can run off of one pump, which costs me almost a dollar a day. Now it's electricity rates since I did all this. It's probably a dollar and a half a day to run upwards to six tanks with one pump. And so where are you going to run an indoor system for fish. So that's why I do it outdoors. I can take what I consider the same setup that a, a pe person will do or a company will do indoors. I can do the same thing outdoors for, all, for no cost other than the capital cost of putting this stuff together. So, so I can run it for a dollar a day. What the, who would, whoever thought of that? All right, so I'm gonna go through and, and I get away with not even aerating in the tanks. Now, you would have thought that you would have had to aerate, but I don't. If I'm changing the water uh, once an hour in the tank, that's 1,000 gallons, then it's, um, it's fine. And I'm, I'm running my single pump at 70 gallons a minute for three tanks. I can, uh, I can raise that up because my pump can take... 180 gallons a tank and you have to take into account the, the head and everything but you can do all of that for for pennies basically all right so I'm just gonna show you what I set up now when I talk about this single pond here we go here's here's this pond this is a quarter acre or less now that that's awful small and I know that there's a couple of uh, manure pits that are way, way, way bigger than a quarter acre. But this is all I'm using. And right now, I've successfully taken out 10,000 perch a, a summer. And the, the beauty of this is I never put a fish in the pond. There are no fish in here. All right, so I, I built the dock. I got this single little pump. And I bring in the water, and I bring it in here, and here's my main line manifold, and each each distribution line comes up there, 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 and there's two drains on this this these tanks. I'm not going to show you this. This is another seminar, if you will. I just wanted to get through some of this. Um, I I spit the water so that that uh, the water. Uh, the, the water coming into the tank is tangential to the side of the, of the, of the wall. 
And, and that spins the water. I have my feed up here in a belt feeder and it's dropping, it's a slow sink pellet and it's, I'm spinning the water so that the water, uh, the pellet distribution is going horizontally and it's a slow sink so it's also vertically. Now every fish in that tank is going to have exposure to the pellets all day long as it, as it goes around and down. Now about 80% of the water, and I, it's the only thing you can't see here, comes out the bottom and goes out, now, there's a stand pipe in here where the water overflows. And that water comes back in here, comes right back into the pond. That's all clear water. The waste part of it, which might have some food in it, but it has all the feces, that goes down and there's a bottom drain here and it comes up here. This pipe actually uh, sets the height of the water in the tank. And then all that waste goes down in here. And this is my common waste pipe that goes into this settling tank. And then I can aerate that tank. And then that overflows and goes into a leach bed. So I'm, I'm, it's almost a septic tank that, uh, that I clean the water and it goes right back into this pond. It's very simple. So this whole thing I built for peanuts, if you will. And I can operate on a dollar a day, and I can raise 10,000 fish off of the electricity plus the amount of food you feed. And, and I don't know, everyone can do this. So, all right, that's that. And if you, you know, if you have questions, we can come back, I guess. The economics, um, this, this system is to design to take a four to five inch fish and get it from that size to eight inches or bigger by the end of summer. So what am I doing? I'm only operating this whole system between May and September and then I shut it all down and go home. So that's the labor of it. So an indoor system is gonna be a little bit bigger. They're gonna take the same situation but they're going to try to um, probably do one third more fish they're going to try to get two thousand or two fish per gallon i'm trying to do 1.5 so they're going to get a little more out of an indoor system than me i don't trust my my i don't do any calculations on all of this but indoor to make that system work they put more money into making it work indoors so i'm not i'm not willing to do that i'm cheap and, and I want you to be, I don't want you to be cheap, I want you to be, uh, pay attention to what it actually costs to get the job done. And make sure the, the fish are satisfied and it's all oxygen. So, um, what do I have? This is, you know, so the bottom line is, is, is right here. Um, right here. No matter what happens, in order to satisfy the fish, you're doing, uh, you got to have at least five parts per million oxygen. And uh, you can get lower. I've been down to two, but they don't like you. So uh, in, the, in the springtime, it's going to be eight or higher. Bob, uh, you have a question? Yes, uh, Bill. Is there a means of measuring that? I'm kind of big into measuring, and I'm not familiar with measuring oxygen level and in the water. Is there a tool or piece of equipment out there that's used for that? Yes. Uh, there's a number of companies have dissolved oxygen. They call them DO meters, dissolved cool. oxygen meters. And I mean, they've got some that you just strap right to the, but everything is, it's a probe uh, that measures the oxygen. Some of them I've got, um, I've got one now that I put right on the tank and it, and I can I have a monitor for it where it can do high and low. And if you get too high, it won't go on. If you get too low, it goes on, even without electricity. It'll go on, and it'll trip a valve, which opens a, a standby oxygen tank. So I've tried to solve all the problems that could occur, but that's never happened yet. I mean, well, it has happened, and I've got, uh, I might have something in here. But uh, I want to do a little more on the economics. Okay, so I'm assuming 1,500 fish per tank. 
um, your fillet yields, uh, you should get 16 pounds out of every 100 fish. 16 pounds of fish, and uh, therefore uh, 16 times 15 is, is 240 pounds of fish for every tank that we have working. That's a lot of fish. So if you, uh, you if, if, if you're in a restaurant, you would typically get a third of a pound uh, per plate. And maybe sometimes they give you more if that's all you're there for. But um, so a family of three, which is a, the standard size house, that's three fish is one pound. So you got 240 pounds. You know, that's putting it relative. So you can have one tank. You can feed all your neighbors and yourself with um, one meal a week. That's a lot of fish. And so I, if I, I showed you, I could have this, that one pump will give me six tanks. So that's quite a few. Now, the, the price uh, of, of per trade now, when I started, it was around $6 a pound. We were always competing against the Great Lakes. Well, that went away. And for a while, we were actually able to get $25 a pound for these things. Well, I never went up that high because I don't want to offend my clients. So I always, right now I'm at about 15, which is a pretty good number. So if you plug that into the, so 15 to $20 a pound, if you plug that in, you're going to end up with $3,600 per tank every year. And that's a, well, my question, is that a current price for coming into 2024 here? Yeah, okay. that might be low. Okay, it might be low. I, I understand with world trade and all that, a lot of that's being disrupted. So Now, the nice thing is that perch are, perch flays freeze well. So if you think about it, the best time to put them on the market is the day before Lent. Because okay. the price might be, you know, yeah. yeah. Okay, some more economics. Okay, let's talk about capital expenses. Um, if you don't own your own stock, now here's, this one's variable because the price of stockers, meaning if you took your fish and just sold them to stock ponds is the highest you you can get for them so remember i told you to throw away all those meals no you would sell them out and get at least as much for the females as those by by selling them as stockers so that's you never have waste so you do that uh, but if you you could pay anywhere between 50 and sometimes 75 cents a fish but I'm going to go with the 50 number. This is an old number. Uh, that would cost you 750 to, to fill the tank with the first time. Again, your pump cost is going to be one, maybe a one and a half dollars a day, um, running all day long. Uh, the feed for fish was about 750. That might be up. When I first started, way back when, we were talking 18 dollars for 50 pounds of feed. Now we're at 50 dollars. And so, yeah, they're not bashful. Uh, the total costs about $900 for a single tank. And that's the equipment and all of that. And, and if you um, add 750 to, if you didn't, if you had to buy your fish to stock it. So that's what we have. The one tank um, is at like 1650. So, you know, I, Let's see if I got, these are like, I, I put an asterisk in there. This is like maybe 2018 prices. Now the final economics, um, you have your electricity, it's, a, it's $150. Well, that, that assumes you're, you've got the pump turned on from, from May until September. So you've got that. You've got feed costs, you've got the fish, if you purchased it, and a processing fee. Now... This is on the low side, but I can do that. I can get that yet. Uh, 250 a pound, that'll cost $600 for those fish. Now, some, uh, you, you, you do have the option to sell fish in a round. So you have 500 pounds of fish, and, and I've been able to get about $6 a pound. That's pushing it, but if, if uh, 
I can sell them for more than that if I was going to just stock them. But that's $3,000. So you can get $3,000 by not processing or any of that other stuff. But if you process them, um, your annual income per tank is going to be 36. Now compare uh, filleted fish versus stocking. Well, you might have lost money by taking them back and forth to a processor and, and there's nothing that says you can't process yourself. So that's the final economics per tank. And there's, there's some information if you want to. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. There's a lot of, like I said, I've got six tanks going. Um, but I, I have to, one time I went to um, a farmer's group because I wanted to teach, I wanted to in, get them interested in fish farming, which is kind of hard to do because they, they can't, if they can't count heads, they can't do it. But, but they, uh, we started out the thing and I said, well, how much money, if you were a regular farmer, how much money do you want to bring in off of an acre of land? And the guy says, well, maybe two, three hundred dollars per acre would be a good number for a regular farm. And he says, well, geez, I got a quarter acre pond here, and I'm not using up another quarter, but I'll give you an acre. I'll say I'll take a whole acre out, and I'm at uh, $10,000 per acre, what you just saw. And he said, now, do any of you guys have now, I told you, this is going to be a summer job. Anybody have someone going to college <laughs> that needs it, summer income? Or kids that want to learn how to be a fish farmer and need income? Bob, you have a question? Okay. Oh, yeah, I had a, I had a question. Is there a means of feeding uh, off product you grow on your own farm? Is there anybody out there doing that? Where they take your product, grind it up like you would like a poultry feed or something of that nature, uh, or does it have to be this definitive design pellet that has all these attributes? I've tried to make a fortified pellet using, well, I started with the biggest problem is getting fish protein into a usable form. So, um, and then all the additives, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, there might be 30 different ingredients, and I've got recipes for that. So what I started with was making fish hydrolysis. So I, I take my fish and I digest them down to uh, liquid. And then I can extract the protein fraction out of that. And that's what you're looking for is the protein. And um, we got to the point where, uh, in fact, I had a grant to do that. But we never got to the point where um, we could cost-effectively make a pellet, just doing that was too costly for, for the grant. So I, I never got that far. But I think that making hydrolysate out of your fish, uh, or any fish that is not a target fish, is actually another product that equals in dollar value. It's a you know, it's a value added product. And not only that, if I got into uh, filleting my own fish, which I can do, if I had, you know, a licensed facility, then I could take the scrap, which is a little over 50% of all the product, and I can make a premium hydrolysate that everybody, you know, likes. So, I'm missing some of it, I mean, but there's only so many days in the, and so many years in your life to explore all these avenues. But, yeah, I've been working on it. Wow. Well, Bill, I want to thank you so much. Uh, this was awesome. I appreciate the, the group that's here tonight, uh, that you're patient and, uh, and gave Bill his, his time to explain everything that's going on here. Um, we are planning on doing some additional uh, versions of this. Bill's got a lot more information to uh, talk about, and it will be more fun. Thank you.